and welcome to episode one of the Ultimate Football Show podcast. My name is Chris, and we're looking forward to finally getting to the opening match, which is the host Qatar taking on Ecuador. It takes place on Sunday night, UK time, and we can't wait for the World Cup to start. Now on the podcast, we're happy to support the LilyWhiteFoundation.com, advancing young people through sport. For more information and all the details, visit LilyWhiteFoundation.com. We're going to hear from the regular contributor and former Chelsea and Brighton footballer Gary Chivers, and we'll also find out much more as well over the next 23 podcasts. Each match day has its own podcast as we look forward to the World Cup in Qatar. Let's have a look at the headlines going into match day one, and Sadio Mane joins a long list of injured players who will now miss the whole of the World Cup after Senegal confirmed the striker will not recover in time from his injury that he sustained whilst playing for his club team Bayern Munich in the German Bundesliga. So a big loss for Senegal. We wish him all the best. And the list just continues with all these injured players that are going to miss the World Cup in 2022. Not long to go now until both England and Wales get their World Cup campaigns underway. They both play their first matches on Monday. We'll have uh, great interviews with some football experts in episode two. Now that's going to be out on Saturday, a couple of days ahead of Monday's fixture, so you can have a good listen to that. So let's have a look then. Match day one with uh, Gary Chivers. And Gary, will playing the World Cup in the winter time be helpful to some of the European teams? We've heard before from pundits and experts some of them coming out and saying normally they would go to a world cup in the summer after a long domestic season carrying injuries feeling tired wanting to go to the beach go on holiday with their family obviously the world cup takes center stage and all players want to go to the world cup but this time they're going to go in the middle of their season so even though we've seen all of these injuries is this a good time for the Europeans to play this tournament? Because they normally play it, of course, in the summer. It probably is a better time for the Europeans. I mean, you know, playing at Qatar in the summer would have been absolutely horrendous and not an option, really, because uh, it's probably 40-odd degrees, so it's a better time. I just think um, having the break halfway through the season... But they're not having a break, are they? They're going out and playing the World Cup. So, you know, they've, they're they into their season. Will it benefit us? You could say a little bit, but there's, yeah, there's not a lot in it. Have you seen so many injuries going into a World Cup than we have this time around? And Kunku from France was injured the other day. Broya's now out for Armenia. You know, we've, we've had Chilwell out, J- Rhys James is out, Carl Walker, and they're now saying we'll be back for the group game to start off with against Iran. We've had Calvin Phillips out. I mean, it's just been a nightmare of all these players. Pogba's injured and Gal Conti's injured. I mean, it's, it, it's just so many, aren't there? It's horrendous, really. But when you look at the, the modern-day professional now, the modern-day professional is expected to play not just... 38 games with, with the cup 60, games. Isn't it, really? It's 60, 65 games, 70 games. Yeah. Then they go away um, f- for their sponsors in the summer. Mm. They play they play games when they're when they're having their pre-season. Yeah. Football's football's 12 months of the year. Yeah. And even now, the, the players and some of the teams that are not going to the World Cup, they're playing friendlies. Everson have got a friendly. The last thing they need is a friendly. What they need is three points. <laughs> you don't need a friendly. They, they know how to kick a ball. I mean, isn't it crazy? It's, it's, it's mental. And, and Frank needs three points at Everton, by the way. Um, they're mm. suffering at the bottom of the table, or near the bottom of the table. Um, needs to get a, 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 a run of results or a string of results together yeah. to, to, to instill a little bit of confidence in that side. Now, we mentioned the weather. So I had a look online. I Googled it because I'm not that clever. But my computer is massively clever. It tells me everything I need to know. So I Googled it and I put down, what is the coolest month in Qatar? And you know the coolest month in Qatar? Well, you've got to be, you've got to be telling me the coolest month in Qatar yeah. has got to be yeah. 
what we're in, November? Incorrect. No points for the mastermind judge. The coolest month in Qatar is January. And when does the tournament finish? <laughs> <laughs> so, who has made that decision? Who is that? Who, who sat down and thought, I mean, one of the reasons why they're playing it is because it's obviously a lot cooler than what it is in the summer. Yeah. But if the coolest month is January... Why don't they play in January? It, 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 that's a must. That is an absolute must. Because there's no, there's no pressure for them to play November, December, is there? And there was no pressure to do it in those two months. They just wanted it in the winter. Well, then you should have done it in December, January. Or January, February. I reckon it's because of the Champions League, you know. They don't want to push the Champions League back too far. Because if they played in January, February, when would they play the Champions League? You see, when, when you look at it as well, when you, when you look at the whole situation, I mean, it's been ludicrous from start to finish. You know, stopping our season. We've got the best league in the world. And all of a sudden, we're stopping it for, for five or six weeks. Yeah. Which is, then all the players come back. Mm. You'll get injuries from that, you know, that an impact on the on yeah. the team's performances who they play for. I mean, it's completely and utterly bizarre. So, does the Brazilians, the Argentinians, and the South Americans in general, Mexico maybe, certainly Brazil and Argentina, they've got good squads. Would, would they have a real good chance? Because it's going to be, I mean, it's going to be twenty nine, thirty degrees in November, December. So it's still going to be hot for the Europeans. And, and as we've seen with, the, with the, the breaks and stuff that they had in, in the summer, you know, you, you're out, you're, you're on your feet, aren't you? 90 minutes, then they go into extra time, dreaded penalties. The, the South Americans must have some kind of benefit and some kind of advantage. And the Africans like Senegal would have an advantage. We're playing in that kind of heat all the time. Yeah, it'd be, it's a marvellous advantage for them. And, and uh, like you said, um, the Brazilian side, I mean, when you look at that, Argentina, yes, they've got a half decent side. Any side with Messi in has got half a chance. But when you look at that Brazilian that Brazilian lineup, you've got Anthony, Gabriel Jesus, Martinelli, Pedro, Rafinha, Richarlison, Rodrigo, and Vinicius Jr. Yeah, you're making me a bit um, jealous here. I should be Brazilian, I, mean, I think. I mean, it, you know, what, <laughs> what a squad to have. And on top of that, They've got two, two not bad goalkeepers because Brazil, you know, Brazil never used to play with a goalkeeper. Yeah. They, they were always rubbish, the goalkeepers, yeah, yeah, well, you yeah. know. But all of a sudden, you're going to get through the, the Brazilian side, you're going to hit their back four, yeah. and then all of a sudden, you're going to look up and you're going to see either Allenson in goal or Edison. And by the way, who's the best goalkeeper out of them two? I would have thought Edison because of the way he controls the ball and he can pass it. Right. No? Yeah. I mean, they're both great shot stoppers, aren't they? Brilliant, brilliant keepers. But I think Edison, is, I think without doubt, the best goalkeeper with his feet in the league, possibly in the world, actually. Because he, he can pass a 60-yarder. I mean, midfielders can't do that. On the half volley as well. Have you seen him when he just flicks it up yeah. and he, he just half volleys it and it keeps, it's like an arrow. Yeah. It's brilliant. It is ridiculous, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. So the first game of the World Cup is coming up. It's going to be Qatar against Ecuador in Group A. It comes up on Sunday night. We're really looking forward to it. All these games finally are coming around. Obviously, we don't know a lot about Qatar. Most of the team, in fact, all of the team play over there in, in their Qatari league. So, you know, it's all YouTube and Google and, and Wikipedia and, and just watching them on online I guess there's, there's no way we're going to know too much about them they've got a couple of strikers that seem to do quite well for them but um, you know it's going to be a tough ask to to do well in the tournament but how important is it do you think for Qatar to do well or is it all about showcasing Doha and everything that's around the capital city I honestly think it's all about showcasing Doha and, and, and what's around um, but when I look at that Ecuadorian side I mean one standout player and he, he could be if he was playing in a better a better team hmm. Casiedo who plays for, for, for Brighton he's, and he's been outstanding I've watched him in all the games this year he's been something else and what kind of a midfielder is he would you say he, he is an, an Angola Kante yeah. he tackles he chases runs back but also also he's got an engine on him he's box to box He's brilliant, mm. absolutely brilliant. He's, he's been the standout player for Brighton by, by a country mile. He's been their player of the season so far. 
So Group A is Qatar, Ecuador, Senegal and uh, Holland or the Netherlands, depending which way you want to call it. Netherlands are going to be favourites. They always seem to do well early on in World Cup. Senegal have got Mane, but he's out for the first game. That's a big blow. Sadio Mane out of the first game. Another injury. They've got Mendy in goal, who's a Chelsea keeper, who isn't very good with his feet, is he, to be honest? I mean, he, he can save a shot, but he can't pass the ball to save his life. He has, he, has, he has struggled with his feet. But then you look at some of the saves he makes, and he makes some wonderful, <laughs> wonderful saves. But he's, I think, do you know what it is? I think he's looking, when he gets the ball at his feet, I think he's looking for the perfect ball. And he, he, mm-hmm. he, he sort of like freezes really half the time. He's got something in his head where really someone should just say, as soon as you get it, just lump it forward. He does seem to have that panic mode, doesn't he? Where but he, he looks to chip it. He looks yeah. to chip it out to the fullbacks. He looks yeah. to chip it out to the wings. And if you're not good, good at that, just lump it forward. In typical English spirit, we don't know a lot about Qatar, so they can't win. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, so we don't know how good they are, so they'll be rubbish. Right. So right. Netherlands are pretty good, but if they can keep it all together, they seem to have a little bit of infighting. But like the Belgians, it must be a low-lying country thing between the two of them. So Senegal and Ecuador are going to battle out with the Netherlands for that group. You would have thought yeah. if Mali is out the first game, and I always think in World Cups. You have to start well, don't you? Yeah. If you start well in yes. the first game, yes. you've got the momentum, you've got the confidence, and you're not looking over your shoulder to see what the other teams are doing, if they're drawing, if they're winning. You've got to win the first game. Yes. So if Ecuador can go beat Qatar in the first game, and obviously Senegal and Netherlands can't both win, Ecuador might have a real chance of getting through. If, if you put it like that, yeah. But, I, I, listen, but you don't think so? I, I just think this, this, this Dutch side, if they, if they start playing like they can play, Mm. We'll just walk it. I, I just think they'll be, they'll probably be out having a party before the before the start of the, the, the first game, really, because they they must think to themselves, you know, we, we are through, we are through. Yeah. But you just don't know with Senegal, you know, and, and like you said, Mane, Mane being out is a massive miss to him. I suppose if you're going to be out, it's the Netherlands game you want to be out because that's the hardest game for. Yeah. Them. So if he's back for Ecuador and Qatar, then they might get six points there. That might be enough. The, I think the Senegal-Ecuador game could be the pivotal game in that group, really. I, I definitely think it will be. Whoever wins out of them is going through with, yeah, with, with, the, yeah. with the Dutch. I'm Gary Chivers, and this is the Ultimate Football Show podcast. So looking to the heroes of the World Cup coming up and potential heroes, top scorer, I'm going to go for Karim Benzema of France. Very, very controversial, obviously, because he's just won the Ballon d'Or and he scores goals every week. So I'm not really very clever on that. But I just think you need a team that's going to go a long way. France will probably go a long way and he's going to be playing every game. I mean, he might be substituting late on for Griezmann, for Giroud or somebody like that. Now, Nkunku's out, so that's one less for them, but they've still got uh, Mbappe in there as well. <laughs> he's going to start. I would imagine Mbappe and Benzema will probably start. You've got the small guy fast, Mbappe, and the, the centre-forward in Benzema. So I'm going to go for Karen Benzema as my leading scorer over the tournament. Who do you fancy to knock in a few goals? Well, I hope Harry Kane does and uh, same as you you hope Harry Kane uh, scores a few oh, yeah. goals everyone hopes he scores a few goals that means we're going further but I have to say uh, Gabriel Jesus I think would be top goal scorer I think I th- so. yeah I think he's a poacher around the box comes alive when the ball's in the 18 yard box a decent player had a great season for Arsenal yeah. um, he's playing very very well at the moment and I think if they sort out the, the options what they've got or well, do you think they'll forward. start him because they've got so many like you mentioned them earlier oh, on I'm not, I'm, I'm, when you've when got to get you, in the team when first. you just look at the, the players they, they've got to hand I mean they, they are they are by you know can we not buy down. one we, 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 I tell you what we could get two it'd be fantastic <laughs> eh, to come and join our squad yeah, we, want, we get a keeper they don't need two of those do they <laughs> <laughs> on one of the forward lines. Although our keeper's quite good, you have to say our quick. Yeah, but he good. makes a mistake. He's, he's liable, isn't he? 
bleak it's my wife always line. watches John Pickford and she says what's he doing out there why is he out there he's on the halfway line sometimes and he's ordering popcorn off the little kid that's selling it down <laughs> it, he's get in your 16, 18 year old boy stay there yeah but he's an angry man and he's always he always seems angry doesn't he yeah he's always angry one of the reasons why he is angry yeah. is, is, is he's got a lot of pressure on him isn't it the yeah, haircut? Yeah. I thought it was his haircut. That well, his haircut's haircut. bad, but uh, but he, I think he's, I think he's a he's got a lot of pressure on him. When you think they're they're at the bottom of the table, mm. and it's where he's he can stand out, can't he? He's got so many shots coming at him. He's got, got so Con- few. Connor Cody and James Tarkovsky in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> How much pressure do you need, as a kid? Yeah, difficult, difficult. Not, not good. Okay, so Gabriel, cheers just for you. Benzema for me. Right. Best keeper. I'm going to go. For uh, Thibaut, Thibaut Courtois from Belgium. Yeah. Because he s- saves everything, pretty much, except for the ones that goes between his legs, because he's so tall, he, yeah. he struggles to get down so quickly. He's six foot seven, yeah. or six foot six, punches the ball, never catches. No. That really infuriates me. But keepers in my time, you can say you're old and things like that, always come and caught the ball. He's six foot seven, always wants to punch it and they all want, want to punch it now I love a keeper to come out and catch the only keeper that comes out and catch that I can sort of recall now is probably the smallest keeper is Hugo Lloris from Tottenham and France yeah. he always tries to catch it yeah. and he's the smallest of them all yeah. isn't he yeah um, but I think Courtois he's just got this knack of being in the right place at the right time and he's he's a bit like De Gea was a few years ago if he doesn't save it with his hands he'll save it with his feet he, he, he just seems to know where that goal is. He's, he's, he's you know, got it down to a fine art. So I think he might be the, uh, the, the best keeper. I, I'm going to go for Edison. Edison. I'm going to go for Edison. Uh, and, and also on top of that, I'm going to go for him making the most goals as well, I think. And most assists? Most assists. I, I just, I just, the goalkeeper, the most assists. As a goalkeeper. Because he, he, he looks for one-on-one situations. Wow. Straight away, when he gets the ball out with his right foot... He's looking, can I, can I affect play? And he goes, bosh, 50, 60, 70 yard ball. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. There we go. Controversial. Yeah, that is controversial. Goalkeeper. Yeah. You'll with the good, most assist, with the most assist. You'll get a good out prize. of goalkeepers, not midfield players, oh. out of goalkeepers. No, no, no. Yeah, all, yeah, yeah. Bets, all bets are off. No, yeah. <laughs> all, all bets are off. <laughs> now, I've not asked you about this, so I'm just going to mention this guy because I think he's, he's going to be a fantastic player. Uh, and a, there's always a young player that sort of comes through. Bellingham would be one of the, the, the major ones for England, of course. But Jamal Musayela, who is, plays for Germany, he plays for Bayern Munich. He was in Chelsea's books as an under-17, under-19. And Chelsea let him go. And he's playing in the Bundesliga every week. And he's a forward, sort of wide forward. They've got, he's so fantastic. He's only 19 or 20. And just watch out for him when you're watching the games. For, if he gets in the German team... If, whether he plays or he comes on, uh, Musayla is an absolute talent and somebody to watch. But I suppose we're all hoping that Bellingham does the business because he's a great talent. So is Foden as well, I suppose. Do you know what? I was just about going to say that. Phil Foden, I love him. I love him to death. You know, he, he's exciting when he gets the ball. He takes people on. He's, he's not one to backtrack. He has a go. Um, I just think sometimes they need to give him a free roll mm. instead of playing him in a, a dedicated left left wing or left wing back or right wing back. I think he's got to be closer to the centre forwards because he's got pace, he's got control, can do anything with the ball. Is that one of the downsides of the English football mentality? Is that everyone has to play in a certain position, whereas like Messi doesn't play in any position, does he? Mbappe doesn't play free in any role, position. free role. They you know, free Pogba doesn't play in any position. I mean, look at the, you know. Karl Hans Rummenigge from Germany in the old days. Lothar Matthias didn't play in any position. Platini, just let them do what they want. You know, that's where we we lacked in the eighties when players like Glenn Hoddle was, I was, gonna, was told. Do you know what I was, was told say to play yeah. in the centre? Me, play him where he wants to. Be. He can pass the ball. You're not going to get a, a, a ball from from Peter Reid, are you? I mean, you know, all fairness to Peter Reid, he was a good tackler. I never saw him pass a thirty yarder anywhere. The thing, the thing with with, with us is. We look. We don't look. We look at our uh, our certain players like Glenn Odell, and I played against him many, many, many times. Uh, what a brilliant player! Yeah. But we always look as a nation 
that things that they can't do, yeah. that they can't yeah. do. Like we wanted Hoddle to tackle. Mm. We want him to run back. No, no. Put him in a free roll. Give him the ball. Give him the ball. I remember playing against him um, and I was playing at Loftus Road and someone's whacked a ball, whacked a ball, probably 40 or 50 yards. He's flicked it over someone's head as the ball's come towards him and scissor kicked the volley, went two inches past the post. And I remember just running past to him and, and, and I actually said to him, I said, that was absolutely brilliant. Deserved the goal, although he was on the opposi yeah. op opposition side, but deserved the goal. Such a skillful, skillful player. Skillful player. I've got to say, that's very sporting of you, Gary, but on the other hand, you weren't really used to winning anyway as a footballer, so... <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm not surprised in one way. He went to Monaco, then he came back and played Chelsea. He when did, he came back yeah. and played Chelsea. But he had to become manager to give himself a free role. Yeah, yeah. Because he, he went the third centre-half, didn't he? Did you never try that? Well, yeah, I've got to try that. Try yeah, I, 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 I don't want to be a defender all the time. I'm going to be central midfielder. I'm going to be the manager. <laughs> I, I tell you what, what a role to play. If you play it, if you play it well, you don't have to defend too much. You, you, you get your your two centre halves tight. You get the ball off the keeper. Couple of strides, you look into it, forty or fifty yard balls. Yeah. God, Jesus, play that with a cigar on your mouth. Who's going to win the World Cup? I mean, we've mentioned the Brazilian lineup. We mentioned all those strikers, the keepers. They've got Rafinha in there as well, who played really well for Leeds at last season and went over to. Barcelona and he's playing really well in midfield. They've, they've got great defenders, they've got massive experience, as we say, with Thiago Silva, Dani Alves, and, and others in there as well. For me, I can't really see past Brazil unless they self destruct. I can't see anyone else beating them. They might get close to them. They certainly were not going to be in that 7 1 German Brazil result, is there, this time? Oh, no, it'd, it'd never be like that. But, uh, you know, I look at the German side, and it's probably the poorest German side we've seen for for quite a, uh, a long while now, but but they always seem to turn up on the big occasions, didn't they? Yeah. You know, they always, they always, like, I think I told you, didn't I? I, I told you this story, but maybe it was... Yeah, about the we, football pitch. Yeah, the football pitch, and they're, they're just always, always prepared. If you want to listen to the story, it's in the bonus episode, the squad announcements, it's in there. Gary tells us about the story of the German football team. Highly prepared, I think. They're very, very... Oh, just, uh, just they don't leave no stone no, unturned. No. It's brilliant the way they prepare themselves. And they'll be prepared again, ready mm. to go. So who's going to win it for you then? Well, I hate to agree with you, so I'm not going to agree with you. I, I'm going to say... Costa Rica, if, did you say? No, 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 no. I can't believe you said that. Listen, with Karen Benzema, Dembele, Kylian Mbappe... Yeah, Dembele, yeah. You've got to think, France have got to have a great chance, haven't they? If they all like each other, because they all that, that, that's another team that has a go at each other, doesn't they? Yeah. Well, Pogba's not in there, and he seems to be a bit disruptive, so he's not in there this year, yeah. is he? Yeah. Well, they're in, in Group D, France, Australia, Denmark, Tunisia. So they'll, they'll breeze that, won't they? And I, I have to tell you, I remember going over to France a few years ago when I was in the World Cup, and um, it was showing all the, the, the World Cup games in France, every, every, every single game and then as soon as France get knocked out they took it off the TV <laughs> you did took it off the papers no one wrote about it it wasn't on the TV didn't it, it didn't happen nothing nothing happened when they win it everyone knows about it when they lose yeah. wow so I'm going to go I'm going to go France to, to go against you I, I can't wait for the Brazil France final it'll be good won't it I'd be brilliant that would be, be absolutely yeah. brilliant yeah, yeah. good stuff you're listening to the Ultimate Football Show podcast with Gary Chivers and Chris Barnett. As you can see, we're happy to support the Lily White Foundation. And I spoke to John Gus Ferguson from the Lily White Foundation recently and asked how did the initial idea about the foundation come about? If you go back to 2016 when we first conceived it we were supporting a number of charities mainly around children's charities and uh, attending a lot of charitable events and when we started looking into some of the charities the costs uh, were extremely eye-watering in terms of operating a charity and and we discovered that 
the amount of the percentage of money getting through to causes from donations was actually nowhere near what you know we would expect and and things like 60 percent of the donations getting through to the actual causes uh, 60p in the pound was actually considered really good and my business partner and I looked at things and uh, just thought we could probably do this cheaper and better and and we looked into establishing our own foundation Uh, we'd always wanted to try and give a bit back having done reasonably well for ourselves and um and we were able to recruit a independent board of trustees who all give up their time for free. And we were able to use our in-house legal team to set the charity up and to run it and to make sure it complies with the Charities Commission and the regulations. Mm-hmm. Banking we were able to get done for free. The auditing and accounting is largely for fair as a small cost, but nothing much. And we were able to call on the the people fat friends and connections that we'd made over the years to to largely give up their time and um it meant that we run the charity pretty much at 99 percent point even probably even more of of donations go through to the causes so that was the reason behind it um we've always my my business partner i've always been interested in sport and share a love of sport and you know uh, and we've always based our businesses around that love of sport i suppose and how did you choose to go to the, the right course? How did you, you make uh, so, that so what we do is um, we invite applications from causes and projects that are looking at helping uh, children and young people in socially or financially disadvantaged circumstances and where they're actively trying to do something, get them into sports, sports teams, uh, activities, youth groups, anything that they wouldn't normally be able to have access to, um, then we will consider that that application would go to the Board of Trustees. As I said earlier, it's an independent Board of Trustees, which we have no control over. They, they will approve or, or not approve the, the application and they control the money in the bank account. So we, uh, although we founded the foundation, we have actually no um, control over the money or, or influence. It's all done by independent oversight. And it's is this for children. Is there any certain age? No, it's it's no, there's no age group. There's no global um, restrictions either. It can be any any anywhere in the world if the cause is correct. I mean, to date, it's been primarily focused on on the UK and and some nearer European causes. But um, we could go anywhere with any age, providing it fits the mandate of alleviating poverty or social circumstances. Um, and encouraging team sports participation or activity. That's John Ferguson from the Lily White Foundation. For more information, visit lilywhitefoundation.com and part two of the interview will be in episode two, which comes out on Saturday as we look ahead to the games on Monday on the second match day of the tournament. Well, that's it for episode one. Watch out for episode two on Saturday. It will be landing on all of the podcast platforms, SoundCloud, YouTube as well as Anchor. We've got Stitcher on there, Apple and Spotify, just about everywhere you listen to your podcast. We'll be looking at Monday's games at the World Cup featuring both England and Wales and the USA getting action too. It's going to be fantastic. All of the top players, all of the top names, with myself, Gary Chivers, and a load of guests as well. All experts looking at the games. So, we'll see you for episode two. See you then.